All right. Hello, everyone. Are we? All right. Shalom Aleichem. Welcome, everybody, to Mizumin. I'm Rabbi Chai Posner. No, I'm not. But uh, Rabbi Chai Posner is not here this evening. So I'm going to try to tell funny jokes and be charming like he is. Hopefully, I'll do well. Um, no, no, no. That's my job. <laughs> Hey, Rabbi, how you doing? Baruch Hashem. I'm almost finishing my book. How is your book coming? Um, definitely not as good as yours. I didn't say as good. That's, <laughs> I, but how close to finish? Yeah, Tell so, everybody what you're doing. Yeah, so um, I, I, when I first, when COVID first, well, welcome everybody. Shalom. When we first started, um, when COVID first started, started and we all were in our homes, I started to write a, a commentary to a Mishnah per day of chapters of the Fathers, Pirkei Avot. And, and I did that because people couldn't come to Shul and say Kaddish. So this was a, an opportunity for them to learn something and elevate and connect to the soul of their loved ones. I did that for around three chapters and then we got back to Shul. Um, in the meanwhile, I continued to, to write and I basically, I have two more Mishnahs left of all chapters of the fathers, Baruch Hashem. I'm wow. really excited about that. So I sent it to Rabbi Wahlberg and he, he said he liked it. I think he did. I'm not sure if he was being nice, but um, well, he was being nice, but I'm not sure if it was only being No, nice. no, it was both. Okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so we're going to, we're going to try to publish it through the shul. So I'm trying, I'm going to start editing it. And, if we uh, have a sponsor, let me know. This is something we hope to send out to all of our congregation uh, before Pesach. God willing. It's kind of like a lot of messages connected to COVID um, and like being home and uh, a lot of inspiring words to kind of elevate our souls. So hopefully uh, you'll enjoy it. Now, I shared that with Rabbi Wahlberg and of course he uh, shared that he, he's also working on a book. And that's uh, pretty much done, right, Rabbi? It's, I have a little bit more, and I'll just about be there. Um, it's going to be part of uh, the conc my concluding year. This is my concluding year as the rabbi. I'll then move on to being the rabbi in residence. And it is the 100th anniversary of the congregation. And I thought I would put something together um, in honor of that. And it's based on my sermons, but it is not a sermon book. It's called What We Can Really Learn from the Rich and Famous. And I think, uh, I, read. I don't know if it, I don't know if it will make it to um, Oprah's book club, but you got to take what you can get in this business. Yeah, I read uh, one entry. It's, um, it's different than the, than the sermons. It's got like a, like a, um, Takes, you take like a, a ver, like a, um, a quote, then you a elaborate. It's kind of like... Person, and then analyze that and what we can learn from that. And it's everybody, it, it's all sort of contemporary. Everybody from Lady Gaga to the Rolling Stones to Philip Roth, um, Donald Trump, and just keep going. Yeah, so we're looking forward to reading that. Should be should be a good one. But um, I'm telling you now, you Eli. I don't have any more of your books here because we gave them all out. Yeah, Eli, right. I'm telling you now, if yours sells more on Amazon than mine do, you're history, kid. <laughs> It'll probably be, be due to your great introduction. But based <laughs> on the sales of my sermon book, <laughs> I, I, I think... You'd be surprised, <laughs> actually. I, I chatted with somebody this week, a professor, and he said, I quote one of those, I quote one of Rabbi Wahlberg's sermons every year in my course. And I said, he says, are there any more of them? I said, yeah, we're going to send you the whole book. So you'd be wow. it's out there. Yeah. Wow. yeah. What were you doing sitting, standing in front of a judge? I was a professor. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> no, I wasn't in front of a judge. I mean, I'm in jails so in front of judges. No, just joking. Um, all right. So welcome, everybody. We have um, a really, uh, I think it's going to be an incredibly informative night. Um, we have... I, I mean, we got a lot of feedback. I asked for questions uh, regarding like this second stage. We had Rabbi, we had Dr. Michael Kleinberg, the director of University of Maryland Greenbaum Comprehensive Cancer Centers Infectious Diseases Program. Did I say that right? So we have him on. 
And uh, we had him on before, but that was kind of like in the beginning stages of COVID and with questions connected to, do we have to clean our vegetables? Do we have to be inside or outside when we talk? Now we're at like another stage in relation to COVID and people are asking a lot of questions connected to the vaccine, to Passover. Can they, if they have a one vaccine, one shot or two shots, can they be with their grandchildren and questions such as that. And so we decided to bring on uh, Dr. Kleinberg once more and he kindly agreed and uh, we're going to chat, ask him our questions, and we're gonna ask you also um, to offer any of your questions in the chat section, we'll try to um, address them. And um, let me just say, Eli, um, first of all, Dr. Kleinberg, you should know your wife just entered the waiting room. Should we let her in? I actually already did. Uh, <laughs> I guess you didn't have much of a choice. No, she's in, you? she's in Florida right now and I'm gonna join her uh, tomorrow. Oh, good for you! But uh, but I, I know I know how to uh, shalom bayit is extremely important. <laughs> Let me ask you before we go: Are you comfortable going on a plane now? Well, I think this is going to lead to uh, some answers to some other questions. Something right, that many before you go, before you answer that and everything else, let me just say something. I read two things today that made me appreciate having you more than ever. I read in Israel that the leading rabbi, um, Rabbi Kanievsky, mm -hmm. who is 93 years old, um, had allowed a pregnant woman to get the vaccine. Yes. And you are frozen. So the question is, should pregnant women get the vaccine, I'm assuming? Okay, is that the question? I think only the rabbi's frozen. All rabbi. right. Okay. So let me. Uh, I can. I, I can. I can answer that question. <laughs> okay, must have been. A and it's it's, it's going to be your, one of the things you're going to hear from all the medical authorities right now, is because of the not knowing the absolute 100% answer, you're getting a lot of fudging, and so this is another fudging answer. So the vaccine was not tested in uh, pregnant women. But the CDC guidance is that uh, is, is saying it is perfectly, it is okay to give the vaccine if the pregnant woman and her doc, doctor after talking to each other consider that the benefit outweighs, outweighs the risk. So the risk here is one of these fudgy unknowns, which is, well, they never tested it. How do we know absolutely 100% sure that it's going to be safe? The answer is we don't. We have history of a lot of other vaccines being given to pregnant women. They're perfectly safe. The potential benefit is that pregnant women, if they get infected, will uh, can often have more severe disease. And there is a theoretical benefit that some of the antibodies that are formed uh, in response to the vaccination will cross the placental barrier and that the, uh, the newborn baby will have some pre-existing uh, antibody that was inherited from the mother that will last for some period of time after birth. So that's the two sides to this. And um, what all plays in here is something we talked about the last time I was on is there's different levels of, I don't want to use the word fear, but uneasiness um, when information is presented. And so that's, I think, why it is left to the doctor and to the, uh, and to the, and to the pregnant woman. So the pregnant woman says, yes, I really want to be protected. I, I think the uh, suggestion is, is do it. I mean, there are examples of pregnant women being vaccinated with no side effects, but in the, in the trials, pregnant women were excluded from the trials. So that's the long answer to that question. All right, great. Um, so there's like a lot of fuzziness around a lot of topics. Uh, we want to uh, hit on them soon. We're getting already, um, questions in the um in the chat section including where's my fish tank it's not i'm in my office today um so I, before we do that though i want to um, ask our trivia question for the week and pray to hashem that rabbi Wahlberg is uh is going to come back to us all right <laughs> here we go here's our here's our trivia question for the week uh it's regarding the four the four bonim the four four i mean um you can, it's regarding the four children the seder pesach so our Parsha brings three of the four questions asked by the four sons at the Seder. So in our Parsha, the Torah lists all four questions that appear in the Haggadah. 
Only three of them appear in our Parsha. One of the children's questions appear in the other, in a whole other Parsha, Parsha Vethanan in the Book of Dvarim. Which son does not appear in our Parsha? Wicked, the wise, wicked, simple, or doesn't know how to ask? Again, A is wise, B is wicked, C is simple, D is does not know how to ask. We're going to ask you to make an educated guess, put it in the uh, chat section, and we'll offer the answer at the end of the show. Okay, so we have Rabbi Wahlberg on. Now we'll, we're, we have a lot of questions that we're going to get to, and I'm just going to ask a few questions that appear here, uh, Dr. Kleinberg, in our chat section. Um, Vaccinating children. I'm going to ask them not in any specific order. Vaccinating children. When do we foresee that happening here in Maryland? Uh, children, okay. I guess that we have to define what children are because children here might be, <laughs> you know, uh, adults. So, but I guess like younger children. Um, uh, what we know officially is that uh, children 16 and older, which I guess they're, they're more uh, monsters rather than children, I guess at 16. But um, 16 and up were, um, are within the official advisory. Again, the vaccine uh, right now have uh, published have not been tested in children. Those studies are ongoing. So um, uh, that pre presents another conundrum similar to the pregnant women. Suppose you have a child, let's say with severe asthma or, or a child who has medical conditions where the benefit may outweigh the risk. I think that would be another example in an older child where you would talk about it with your pediatrician, with a very young child, let's say someone under um, 80 pounds. I don't think there's any dosing guidance, so I have no opinion on that. But right now the guidance is 16 and older is okay. Uh, anything else I think should be discussed with the pediatrician, but it is not currently recommended. Uh, I guess they might be asking also like in terms of the timeline, when do we expect? Don't know. One of the good things, at least about being a child, uh, is that the uh, uh, symptomatic disease is uncommon and serious symptomatic disease is extremely uncommon in children. Um, so th the children would probably be the least needy of those for vaccine and should really be concentrated on those with the highest risk of severe disease, which increases as you get older, but really starts to increase over 50 and really escalates uh, older than that, uh, 65, 75, over 85. Dr. Kleinberg, I, I read today that in the District of Columbia, they are now giving a preference to people who are overweight because they feel those are in greater danger. Should we all go and gain weight as opposed to looking at this crowd <laughs> rather than getting pregnant? Well, I think uh, what we should continue to do is to subscribe to, the, uh, to all the wonderful uh, uh, Israeli cooking uh, uh, shows, you've, you've, you Zoom shows you've had on, because they've actually been quite wonderful, then we'll all gain that weight. Now, there are a series of risk factors that have been identified, and being uh, obese, uh, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, a few other chronic diseases make that list. And so as there is a big hodgepodge of sorting out the hierarchy of who gets vaccinated, um, people with, uh, who have those kind of, of existing conditions will, will, will be recommended to get vaccinated before other healthy people within the same age group. So right now we're vaccinating 1Bs and we're going to move to 1C next week in the state of Maryland. So 1Cs will be everyone over the age of 65 will automatically fit that category, whether they're svelte or thin. And, um, and we're still waiting for uh, the other groups to be defined. It's only a matter of time. The, the vaccine that's coming in the next three months will, will, will cover a lot of people. And then by six months, anybody who wants a vaccine is going to be, going to be able to get vaccinated. Does it make a difference which one? Uh, and I heard there's also a few new ones that are being... Right. So right now, the two uh, approved vaccines work off of an MRA, mRNA uh, technology. So mRNA is basically stands for messenger RNA. And it's uh, basically the, the, the mechanism where the information that's encoded on our genes, on our DNA, is then uh, transcribed onto RNA, which then goes to the factories that make the proteins that actually do all the action. 
So what these vaccines do is they have, uh, they, they have the mRNA so that when they get injected, they go into muscle cells and they go right to the, uh, right to the uh, uh, factories that make the proteins. And the protein that they make is the spike protein. The spike protein then is displayed for the immune system to see and to react to. So that's the way those vaccines work. They're extremely easy to develop and they're uh, quick to manufacture relative to other vaccines. That's why they're out first. The next two vaccines that are going to come out um, are going to be one that's made by AstraZeneca, and, uh, which, you've, which is already approved and used in Europe and several other countries, and one made by the Janssen division of uh, Johnson & Johnson, which are based upon an adenovirus uh, vector. So adenovirus is a relatively benign uh, virus, and there's probably over 100 different varieties that can infect humans. And so they are used as a carrier to take the... Uh, the uh, same uh, spike protein message into the, into the um, muscle cells, which then manufacture the spike protein and display it to the immune system and the immune system then reacts to it. A little bit farther down is a uh, protein, which is a vaccine, which is a more standard vaccine that is gonna be made by, I think I've got the name right, Novavax, which is a Maryland company. Uh, and that one uh, is in trials right now. And that one, hopefully we can expect, assuming everything is accelerated probably later this year, probably summer or something like that. So How there are a number of vaccines vaccine that are all coming. That's a great question. How long does the vaccine protect you? Ah, you have just hit upon, in fact, I studied <laughs> up a little bit about that. The I vaccine asked Rabbi Kanievsky, who was 93 years old and um, didn't get a straight answer. Sometimes rabbis are like that, Doctor. <laughs> well, I'm gonna. Do, uh, I, I must have gone to taken some of the similar classes. Um, this is a, a point of contention um, uh, now. In terms of the vaccine, the vac the vaccines have only been around for maybe five months. Okay, where we're talking about the volunteers who got vaccinated as part of the trials, and they are being monitored for how long their immunity lasts. And I don't know the answer to that. However, we can look at natural infection. So natural infection um, pr obviously produces uh, an immune response for people and people recover and they uh, have immune memory and that is manifest by having antibodies and by actually having specific other specific parts of the immune system. You may have heard of T cells, which are responsible for parts of the immune response and memory B cells, which are important for directing some of the antibody responses and the connections in, within the network of the immune system. And so a paper was published in Science just last week, um, which showed that these immune responses are quite robust going out eight months. Now, since the study only looked at eight months, we don't know exactly how long the, immune, how, how long the uh, immunity will last, but the predictions are it will probably go even longer that longer than that, maybe a year or two years. And then what? Well, what happens in situation for most infections like this is there may be some quieting down over time if the immune system is not stimulated, but the memory is always there. And so 10 years from now, if you were to encounter this virus, even if your antibodies have disappeared, the memory has been laid down. And so the immune system will know how to respond if it sees the virus again. It may take it a little bit longer than if you already have a lot of antibodies floating around. But that's what happens with a lot of other infections we contract or even other vaccines we were given as children where the immune memory is laid down and then gets reawakened if it's exposed a second, uh, a second time. But it's a big question because we don't know whether we're gonna have to give booster shots. Um, it plays a big role into how long we're going to have to wear the masks. I mean, how, how long, long are we going to have to wear the mask? Uh, another tough question. I'll ask Rabbi Kanievsky. Right. Um, uh, in terms of the vaccine, this is the concern, and this is hypothetical. The hypothetical concern is that even though the vaccine clearly, clearly protects against symptomatic disease, Okay, that is, if uh, you get the vaccine and time goes by, so you've got a beautiful immune response, and then you are exposed to the virus again, the chance of you developing symptomatic disease is incredibly small. Now, 
The question though is, even though you're asymptomatic, could you still harbor some virus and then unwittingly give it to others? And we know now that even in natural infection, that about half of the people who become naturally infected have no symptoms. And they are probably responsible for uh, our difficulty in controlling this infection because you're not, if someone's coughing and someone's sneezing, it's easy to say, I'm gonna go to the other sidewalk on the other side of the street. But it's a little bit tougher when someone appears to be perfectly uh, asymptomatic. And so that's a question that's not known. When we come to Shul and Rosh Hashanah this year, are we going to be wearing masks? Um, my prediction is, depends on the penetration of the vaccine. I suspect if, since all Beth to fill a congregants listen to what you recommend religiously, um, we'll all be vaccinated. <laughs> no, no, no. A little sarcasm there, yes. <laughs> Those are the ones who passed away, Dr. Klonberg. I'm talking about our living members. Are they going to be wearing the mask in shul on Rosh Hashanah? I don't know. It's an early Rosh Hashanah, so it's hard to tell. Yes. yes. I don't know the answer to that. But I will say that if you don't get vaccinated, uh, this is for the, the vaccine hesitants, you probably have no chance for a quick return to normal. Whereas I can't predict exactly when we're gonna to return to normal, but it's gonna happen a lot more to people who've already been infected and to those who get the vaccine. Uh, but a question, the second vaccine, what if for some reason it has to be delayed? Is it still effective? The answer to that is yes. The, for the Pfizer vaccine, there's a minimum of three weeks to get the second dose. And for the Moderna vaccine, it's four weeks. Um, uh, so the first dose, you can think of it as priming. And the second dose is then the one that just makes it uh, uh, really flower and come to fruition. So there is, if several weeks later will not harm the response. I wouldn't want to wait a year, but uh, several weeks will, will not harm it. And I, so I don't want people to really be too hung up on getting the exact date because with the fact that we don't have enough vaccine to go, there's gonna be some delays in getting appointments and stuff like that. So I don't want people to be too concerned, too concerned about that. After the first vaccine, how protected are you? And the same thing after the second dose, like what can you do after the second dose? Uh, okay, let's start with the first one. So you will have low level antibodies after the first dose. The numbers that are talked about are about 60% protected. And obviously if you have one dose of vaccine then get exposed to the virus, that'll be almost like your second dose. And um, you know, it, it, I have heard of that where that has happened to people when they've had a mild infection where, the, uh, where they, they got the first dose and then very soon after that, before they developed the immune, a strong immune response, they were exposed to the virus, became mildly symptomatic. Um, after the second dose, the second dose boosts the antibody by what's said six to tenfold, okay? So it, it gives a big jump to infection. And that occurs probably within two to four weeks after you get the second dose. Now, the second part of your question is a loaded question there, doctor. doctor I mean, uh, uh, doctor, yes, doctor, so. Yes, doctor. So that's a little bit. No, harder. no, doctor is do uh, Dr. Shore is the doctor. <laughs> she's, yeah. the do she's the doctor. She's the no, doctor. No, no, she thinks she's really a doctor. Don't burst her bubble, please. <laughs> anyway, so um, I think that's an important question. And, I, and so I want to give you a personal view here because there's nothing official in there. So, what can you do when you're immune? Okay, so big reveal here, and some of you already know this. Mm -hmm is that my wife and I contracted coronavirus way back in March, okay? There's a funny story behind it, but we'll leave that for another time. Um, so we have known that we've been immune since May when we were antibody tested, where we had, and I was, I'd been subsequently antibody tested again and I still have immunity. And so this is something I've thought about a lot. So I got asked, how do I feel about traveling on a plane? Well, me, I'm fine, I'm immune. So yes, I do wear a mask, I will socially distance, I don't want to tempt fate too much, but um, that's my personal view. The problem with flying on an airplane 
is the airport, probably not the plane so much, okay? And uh, now that more people are traveling, it's just, it's just hard to know. Um, but getting back to uh, other things, I can't tell you the number of times I have been asked, when can I see my grandchildren? When can I go see my children? I haven't seen them in 14 months. Dead serious. I have. Good no, we re received head. several of those questions this evening, actually. <laughs> right. And um, so I have been, 2020 was not a terrible year for me because I had the birth of my first granddaughter, which I have a question for you guys later, which is uh, when can I do the baby naming? But um, when can we do the baby naming? But that's another issue. Um, so I luckily have been able to see my granddaughter as frequently as I want, as is my wife and my mother-in-law, because we've all been infected and we've all been immune. And so we've been safe. And now my daughter-in-law, who I know is on this call, has been vaccinated. My son hopefully will be vaccinated very soon. And it will make it a little bit easier for all of us to get a little bit together within a closed circle. I'm gonna be blessed in 2021 because in uh, a little bit over a month, I'm gonna have the birth of my of a grandson. And in thinking about the bris, this is down in Florida, and thinking about the bris, you know, I'm looking at, uh, well, I can go and my wife can go and my mother-in-law can go because we're immune. Um, I don't know what I would do if I wasn't immune. And I to do it through a Zoom connection, it would be really, really hard. And so this is just an example. If you have the opportunity to get vaccinated, please do it because it'll make it a little bit easier. Yes, you'll still wear a mask. Yes, you will socially distance. Yes, you won't hug, hug each other. You won't kiss each other. But it makes some things safer than they would be otherwise because we all know from the recent big spike in infections that over the holiday season, a lot of people were visiting each other because they felt compelled to and there was some transmission of virus. And so if you can cut down on the virus, that'll be important. And, uh, and, and so that's why it's such a hard question to answer. The, the, the most likely answer is yes, it's perfectly safe to do anything, okay? And I think once three months from now, once some studies have been done, that probably will be the conclusion. But is it absolutely 100% safe it's hard to say, because remember, not everybody forms a strong immune, not every, even though the vaccines are 95% uh, effective, there's 5% that aren't effective. Okay? Just the number of people who've, who have been infected, who have then contracted a second case of coronavirus is vanishingly small, probably in the order of 2%. Um, so the numbers are really, really small, but they're not zero. Okay, so there's always these chances for this. And so I think it's gonna take some time for us all to get comfortable once everybody, once everybody's vaccinated, it'll be a lot easier to do. And this gets back to uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the high holidays, which is it'll be, I think more people will attend because more people will be vaccinated. They'll feel safer, even though we'll still do the masks, we still won't shake hands, but people will feel safer because they'll have some a, a big level of protection and that'll be the, the march to normalcy, which may take us some time. Bottom line, if question. you've been vaccinated, can you hug your grandchildren? Yeah. No, yeah. Um, well, by my personal example, the answer to that is yes, uh, but I'm gonna leave that to, to, to everybody. Okay, that's just, my, just, just what I've done with my granddaughter. I got, how, long, yeah. how long? After you've, if you've contracted it, how long does the, how long are you immune for a year? The answer is probably going to be a, the answer is probably going to be a year or two. But there, again, there is a concern that as the, as the immunity weakens, it is possible that if you're, if, if we're, for those of us who caught the virus early, there's a chance that our immunity, some of us who've had it for almost a year, that our immunity can wane, can get lower and, and for instance, in, in my job in the hospital, if I go and see a patient, it's possible I can get um, I can get the virus. I will be asymptomatic. I won't get sick. But suppose, you know, so there is a possibility that I could give it to someone. I think it's a very small possibility, but it is possible. So those who have been infected, you would suggest for them to also get vaccinated as well, or? Um, I personally am going to wait till everyone else is vaccinated, especially while the vaccine supply is short. Um, I probably don't need to get revaccinated, um, but um, 
uh, I probably will wait and get a booster at some time in the future. Um, what's with this herd immunity? We haven't heard much about it now. <laughs> oh, God. Heard about the herd. Eli, I'm trying, Eli. Yeah, no, it's great. <laughs> the concept of herd immunity is, look, the virus only lives for a very brief period of time in each person. So in order, remember, it, it, all it is, is it, it's, it's, it's a set of genes. The coronavirus genes are contained on mRNA, not like in, our, in us, where it's DNA. And so, the, uh, so in order for a virus to survive, it has to infect other people and then other people and other people because the immune system kills the virus. So that's the only way that it can survive. So one person infects three people, you get a pandemic. Suppose 50% of the people are immune. So now the virus that previously could infect three people, if you come in contact with three people, you know, one or two of them are immune, so it can only possibly infect one person. That makes it less efficient. Once you start getting up to 70, 80%, and that's probably gonna be the number, 80% for this particular virus because of how contagious it is, then when an infected person comes in contact with another person, they're likely to be immune. And then that, that, that's it, it's done. That whole line is done. And so once you get enough people with immunity, the virus can't infect enough people for, it to, for the line to stay alive. And then it, it dies out. So that's what herd immunity means. Dr. Kleinberg, um, I see tomorrow Dr. Fauci is speaking at, uh, at Maryland. You've worked with him in the past. Yes. What kind of person is he? He is, he is the type of person that like uh, everybody in the medical field aspire to be, but don't have a prayer of being able to do it. It's a combination of, you could tell he's friggin' brilliant. Okay. You could just tell that from listening to him. Um, the compassion that he has is, 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 is quite amazing. I have a personal story that I won't share with you about even how here the head of the National Institute of Allergy and, and, uh, and Infectious Diseases took time to help my family. However, the, um, he, didn't, he started looking at very strange autoimmune diseases and then HIV came along. And he powered into HIV and became an amazing leading force in HIV. And he and C. Everett Koop, if you remember, C. Everett Koop was the Surgeon General right. under Reagan. He and C. Everett Koop walked into Reagan's office, convinced and said, HIV is a very, very serious problem that needs to be taken seriously, that requires the full force of the United States government to get behind it. And one of the reasons why I so admire Ronald Reagan is because he said, yes, if and he went, opened up the floodgates for making what ultimately ended up being one of the greatest success stories of, a, of a, another pandemic, HIV. Um, and it was just the kind of compassion that I saw from, uh, from Fauci, the leadership I saw from him, his brilliance. And now he stepped into the fore just as much now with the coronavirus. And how he could work, keep his wits about him for the last four years, I give him, I'm not surprised he did it because he never compromised his uh, ethics and his uh, values. So he looked, I, a, lot, he looked I, a little I, bit more chilled out today on, the, on his, on his inter, in his uh, speech, he looked a little bit more chilled out today. I don't know the, <laughs> the reason. Without getting into politics, Doctor, where did the United States go wrong with this virus? Um, I, I think there was a number of mistakes compounded with not really taking it really being aggressively serious about it. Let's put it that way. It could have used um, a lot more bully pulpit in the sense of adv advocacy. So if you would have had everybody in the government for the last uh, year plus wearing masks, preaching, I think more people would have done it and it probably would have blunted it to some extent. On the other hand, this virus is so contagious that to think that we would have stopped it it was not gonna happen. This was not like Ebola, where we could keep it just a little bit, a couple of cases in the United States and that was it. This virus was going to wreak havoc. 
We don't live on an island like New Zealand where they were able to shut down and then stamp it out. But I think um, uh, the vaccine uh, to the point of getting uh, the pharmacy industry and that was brilliant. It was built upon a platform that had been developed uh, for, pan for uh, pandemic response, how to get vaccines quickly. But that part up until the manufacture and the approval was, was, was brilliant. The uh, rollout of vaccination is a little fraught because there isn't enough vaccine primarily, but also because there wasn't enough coordination. So it's a mixed response you know, overall. But I think the biggest thing is more leadership would have been helpful in blunting. So we would have this, this much infection. Eli, you have some. Yeah, we have a lot of questions here, uh, like a lot of them. I'll also ask uh, um, somebody asked about the new strains that are being um, reported on. I'll just ask like two or two questions here. Um, that question, another one is uh, let's read this. As more people become vaccinated and feel comfortable enlarging the social bubble, if they are more likely to now be asymptomatic carriers, that health temperature screenings cannot pick up, doesn't it increase the general risk for those that are unvaccinated like young kids in school? Um, yeah, and the answer to that is, is, uh, is possible. Now I will say from the, uh, from the Beth DeVille experience, um, it appears that uh, it's been, I mean, I get, you gotta give credit to Dr. Shore here and her whole team, but it's been incredibly successful from preschool, elementary school and through the, um, uh, and through the middle school with basically no cases and a smattering here and there of in the high school because high schoolers are high school high schoolers but it's all been managed and so yes you can run schools there probably is some virus circulating among children because they catch it from their parents um, and thank god they're mostly asymptomatic and not harmed by it um, yeah so it is a potential issue uh, and that's why vaccination is incredibly important. In terms of the social bubble, it's going to be a lot easier on your social bubble if your social bubble includes only people who are vaccinated or who have been infected, okay? It becomes a little bit easier that way, a little bit safer. And again, that asymptomatic carriage among vaccinated people is theoretical. It's not been proven yet. That's important. And about the new strains that are being reported upon? Well, okay, the strains that people have heard about. So one of them is a strain from Britain, and I think it's B1.1.1.7 or something like that. And will the vaccines that we take now cover that? That's another question. Well, for that one, it appears that the vaccines are, you get the exact same response. It, but this, it contains several mutations that there's some, that appears that it makes it more contagious, as if this virus could get more contagious, <laughs> okay? So, um, so that's why there's concern here because it, it will speed up the, the epidemic. So if it's, if it's going around at a certain rate and now you have a strains of virus that come in that, are, that can be are more contagious, it will speed up the rate. The excel, it will accelerate the, the, uh, the infection rate. I think the one that people are watching are the South African uh, strain because um, there seems to be some very, very preliminary work on it suggests that the antibodies that are formed to natural infections aren't as effective against that strain compared to the normal uh, coronavirus or even the British coronavirus. And so whether it has developed enough mutations to change it in a way that it now turns into a brand, almost like a brand new virus is a little unclear. So far, it's only in South Africa. Um, so another question I was asked here is, uh, do you have concerns giving the vaccine to teens over 16 in terms of fertility for the future? Yeah, the fertility issue is one of these, um, it's really fall, fallen into a bit of the myth category because the concern about it has risen on, you know, on some websites. Nothing has come out of the scientific literature to suggest that. No, I'm not concerned about it. And the reason for that is the, the, vac the, the approved vaccines are both RNA vaccines. So as RNA vaccines, they are incapable of, for instance, inserting themselves into our own DNA, okay? So that's one concern. I know that's been talked about. That's not answering your question directly. Uh -huh. They're in animal cells. And as people, as humans, we are animals. There is no way 
to go from RNA back to DNA, okay? So these vaccines cannot mess around with our own genes. Now, in terms of fertility, um, seen nothing from any of the literature that suggests it affects anything with fertility, well, you know, what's, whatsoever. Um, I would put it, uh, and uh, so I would not put off getting vaccination for that concern because there's no evidence to suggest that it's true. Another, another question that might be similar, I don't know if this is in the myth or category of myth or not, but um, meds, aspirin, um, I guess allergy medications, how do they work along with the vaccine? Do they, can you continue taking medications or medications don't, don't work? Yeah, I mean, things like aspirin or Tylenol will not affect developing immunity to the vaccine. Now, as you know, both of these vaccines, they tend to have a little bit more side effects than let's say the flu vaccine. So with the first shot, most people will get the sore arm, but a few people will get a little bit of fever but because we end up getting a second shot, so our immune system is already primed. So when you hit it again with the same mRNA and it, and it presents the same spike protein, the immune system, which is kind of just smoldering along, really, really reacts strongly, which is what we want to form a strong immune response. So some people will, get, will even get symptoms for 24 hours of almost like having a flu. So some people I know who've gotten the, uh, you know, the second shot have actually had fevers to 102, 103, have had some shivers and felt like crap for a day. And so the recommendation is to, uh, especially with the second shot, take some Tylenol beforehand and maybe take some Motrin or some uh, Naproxen afterwards, try to head that off at the pass. That's my recommendation, but I know a lot of that has been suggested. The CDC site makes some recommendations, including putting some, some compresses on there just to, you know, just to try to to relieve some of the discomfort. Should you switch arms? Uh, there's no reason, you know, you probably, there's no reason you can't. It doesn't have to be in the same place. Someone I'm the rabbi and I haven't been able to come to shul because of the virus. And if I take the vaccine, I'll have to come to shul. Is that reason enough for me not to take the vaccine? <laughs> so, Ellen Cohn says no. I didn't know we were taking this to a vote. Yeah, well, I'm going to vote as well. No, take the vaccine. Um, you certainly fit into the, uh, because of your youth, you definitely fit into the age group that uh, is currently being vaccinated. And what, and I'm not obese enough? Excuse no, me. No, no just, just on age alone, you make it. So that's okay. So come, come next week, you're perfectly fine. Rabbi, us rabbis are at risk. You got to get back here. It's, it's yep. a lot going on. Dr. Kleinberg, I, I want to say something. You mentioned before, um, you know, how Dr. Shore has really done quite a job sustaining the school the way it's been. And everybody knows she runs a very tight ship and we're not surprised. But what everybody doesn't know is that whenever she's had a question, about how to handle a given situation. You've been there for us time and time and time again. Beth DeFilla is really honored and fortunate to have you as it's a member. Our record in terms of handling the virus as a school and as a shul is as good as most anyone's I know. And that's because we didn't ask a rabbi in Israel or a politician in Washington. Mm. We asked you and you not only gave us guidance, but you were so gracious about it that we really, really appreciate it. You've got to go pack. You've got a flight for Florida tomorrow. So mm -hmm. you go ahead, Allison, oh, yeah. Allison, get ready. He's coming back and <laughs> all of you, so, Absolutely, so. positively take the vaccine. I had somebody, the school has made it possible for the teachers to have the vaccine. Um, it was given at Mercy Hospital. And I heard some people, I'm not schlepping down there. The sheikh from Kuwait flies into Baltimore for medical care and we're not going to drive from Pikesville down to Mercy or wherever it is to get a vaccine that can not only save your life,
but mine and everyone else's as well. So by all means, be wise. We have members of our shul who drove to Berlin, Maryland, out near Ocean City, because they got a slot to get vaccine. Mm -hmm. You need to have that kind of, you need to have that kind of enthusiasm to get protected and, 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 and rejoin the world. Someone which, in the comments which, here, a rabbi over some of the comments here said, if you're not gonna do it for yourself and for the community, do it for Sherry, get the vaccine. Wait, which leads me to the a, a crucial question of all. Will I be able to go to Ocean City this summer? Um, uh, yeah, you'll be able to go. The question is, what's it going to look like? No, will I be able to get out of the car? Yes, you will. Get vaccinated. You will get out of the car. You will. Oh, there's no that. question. I'm getting vaccinated. Yeah, you will. Sh you will. You will socially distance. Um, you will only. Um, uh, you will only congregate with your family and loved ones who hopefully also will be vaccinated and uh do i have to do it with all of them no you get to choose oh okay go ahead and, and the good news is once you're outside by the beach with the ocean breeze your chance of catching something outside is incredibly low okay so because have, it just blows things away yes you can before, go. do we uh before we go i also want to um present our answer it's connected to what rabbi Allward was saying the answer to our trivia question um just gonna do that now so we asked, which of the children does not appear in our Parsha? It's the wise child. So we have, uh, he appears in Dvarim 620. And there it says, uh, there's a little bit of a difference between the verse connected to the wise child and the wicked child. The wise child says, what are these uh, rules and laws that God has enjoyed upon you? The wicked child says, what do you mean by this? Uh, what do you mean by this right? They both say, what did God command you? Everyone asks. They seem so similar. They're both saying God commanded you. So why do we say one is wise and one is wicked? I saw this explanation here. It says when it comes to the wise child, he talks about tomorrow. When tomorrow, your children ask you. The wicked child has a similar, says a similar thing. He says, well, what does this work for you? Just like the wise child. But doesn't talk about tomorrow. And I think this is a really connected to our discussion here. You know, everybody um, is worried about today, but taking the vaccine can help ensure the, the health and the prosperity of our community and our world for tomorrow. So be wise, get the vaccine, stay safe, and uh, keep coming back. Uh, Let me just, in terms of keep coming back, sometimes I feel that we're putting so many programs out there that some of them are getting lost in the shuffle. Mm -hmm. So I just want to remind you of some of the things that are coming up. This Saturday, well, this whole uh, month has been stressing the importance of Shabbat and Shabbos night at Motsai Shabbos. We're having a special Havdalah service with an outstanding entertainer, singer from Israel, Shlomo Katz. I'm mm -hmm. telling you, this is worth your while and really inspiring. Really, it, yeah, it, this it, is it, something it, special. Experience. He takes you on a journey. You you won't know when. Then we got chefs. You have no idea the kinds of chefs that we have. You should know this past week when we had the first program, there were over 500 participants. We're doing this in conjunction with other synagogues and JCCs, but Sherry Brownstein has been the force behind it. And it's really a wonderful, wonderful experience. Next Thursday, instead of Mizumin, we're going to be making it possible for you to participate in a program sponsored by Israel Bonds, which is going to be an hour spent with Amari Stoudemire, yeah. a former New York Knickerbocker basketball player who has converted to Judaism and has quite a story to tell. For sure. Then... That Saturday night, that's a week from this Saturday night after Shabbos, we are having Kalman Samuels tell the Shalva story. Let me tell you the story. Kalman Samuels and his wife had a child with disabilities and one thing led to another and they have established a musical group made up of children with disabilities that has won the hearts of the Israeli people and has been touring in Europe 
and is really, it's a remarkable story. And as it ends up, they're celebrities in Israel, they run Eurovision. They are. Yeah. You know how important Rabbi Samuels is? He got an honorary degree from Bar Ilan University the same night as Miriam Adelson and Dr. Okay. Tsipora Shaw, who is going to be running the program next Motsai Shabbat. We hope that you'll join with us. Mm -hmm. After that, that's at 7 p.m. After that, in two weeks or whatever, on a Thursday night, we are having, I have no other way of describing it than a former terrorist. His father was one of the leaders of Hamas, Mossab Hassan Youssef. You should know there is a, uh, a movie about him. I think it's the Green Prince, I think it's called. I haven't seen it, but it's supposed to be fascinating. And it, just that you should know how real this is. We don't know where he is that we're having this program with him. <laughs> it should be something very special. And then, and then, and then we're having someone, Nikki Haley. I don't know if any of you have heard of her. Nikki Haley is up and coming a star on the American scene and uh it was, it's a really impressive lineup it's pretty amazing <laughs> yeah, it really you, is. you just take a look at your email it's going to come out tomorrow you have so many resources there for Shabbos you have recordings we spent hours on those recordings really just for you for real if you want to know what I would have said this Shabbos if I was in shul you can hear it tomorrow as part of the special Shabbos program where you'll have me delivering, so to speak, a sermon. You're going to have the cantor singing part of the service. Mm -hmm. Until you can come to us, we're yeah. going to keep coming to you. Yeah, you want, you want to hear him sing part of the service? Come on. Hello. Oh, my God. Darling. Yes, hello. All your darlings, oh. all of you. Avi. I hope you. I hope you listen to the videos that we make for you. Avi, okay. do you sound this good in person? In person, much better, much better in person. Much better. And you know why? You know why? Because I always keep on practicing. I never say, "Oh, now it's Corona." Oh, take it a little easy. Never. For me, I when I open my mouth, one is equal to a thousand. But I want to tell you something else. You know why the cantor sounds better in person? Because you're there. That's true. You bring it out. That's true. Just remember... Yes. There is something called the home field advantage. A team that is playing at home is considered to have an advantage. Now, why is a football team having an advantage if it's playing at home? The size of the field is exactly the same wherever they're playing. The only difference is they're playing before a home crowd. And that brings out the best in people. You're the ones that bring out the best in us. And that's why we're going to stay in touch with all of you. You stay well, get vaccinated, and come on back. You all have a good evening and be well. Dr. Kleinberg, thanks so much. Enjoy your visit. Good night, everybody. Laila Tov.